team dynamics, and cohesion. The strength of the team is in each member. The strength of the member is in the team. This was a quote from Phil Jackson. Most sport and a lot of exercise activities require groups or teams. Competition almost always involves more than one person. Group physical activities include multi-person forums, such as exercise groups, fitness clubs, and physical education courses. In team sports, being a part of a cohesive unit can relate to increased success on the field. Players often attribute their success to their ability to get along and to work together towards a common goal. Almost any position in the sport and exercise field requires understanding of the processes and the dynamics of groups. We must consider the nature of sport and exercise groups. Henry Ford once said, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is a process, and working together is success. We think it is easy to define a group or a team, but it can be difficult to differentiate between the two. Groups are defined as two or more people who interact with and exert mutual influence on each other. There is a sense of mutual attraction or interdependence for a common purpose. Members of a group have the following factors in common. They share a collective identity. Members may like and be attracted to other members who share the similar identity. They have a shared purpose or objective. For example, members of a group may focus on losing weight together. The group has structured communication. There are expectations and norms to communication. There may even be common jargon or verbiage that is utilized and easily understood among and by the group an interpersonal attraction. Group members are drawn to other like-minded individuals. Personal and or task interdependence. Group members are willing to work together to accomplish tasks or reach goals. They also have a group process. There are social norms for group participation. And lastly, group members may self-categorize they frequently refer to the group as a possessive by using the words us or we when talking. Jane Clemon, Diana Kirkwood, and Bobby Shell were three women who were all employed at the Mercy Medical Center in Dyersville, Iowa. The three discovered that half of all local health problems were connected to excessive weight. After the experiment, a book was published documenting this experience, The Town That Lost a Ton. This book explains the innovative, program-oriented way to use the support of friends, co-workers, or family to lose weight. So what was it and how did it work? In the spring of 1998, the people of Dyersville, Iowa decided to go on a community campaign to improve their health by discarding pounds. A system was set up through the community to help keep everyone on track with their fitness plan. This program was advertised as a weight loss program occurring in socially supportive environments. Dyersville is a small town and these ladies were able to convince 383 people from a town of approximately 3,800 to participate. This is pretty incredible. Participants form groups of at least six to 10 members which competed for weekly weight loss totals. Even local businesses were drawn into the Fight the Fat, which is what this program was called, with restaurants offering low-fat lunches to support program members. As the program progressed, the ladies devised simple strategies to assist participants to maintain involvement in weekly diet, physical activity, and motivational sessions. This program utilized a group approach and the buddy system. Their theory was that people need support because they do not want to disappoint their partner and because they are inspired and motivated by the success of those who want to help them. The program then succeeds. 
The participants were divided into teams, and the groups named their teams, such as Lean On Me, Sisters Plus, and Melt Away Mamas. In addition, the groups made t-shirts, and they had weekly meetings in which the participants were rarely absent. During the experiment, the participants ended up staying together. The groups and individuals measured success based on weight loss of the team. The groups and the individuals measured success based on weight loss of the team. Individual weight loss was not documented. Each group stepped on a trucker scale at the beginning and the end of the experiment. The community then determined the winning team as the group that lost collectively the most amount of weight. So the bottom line, exactly how much did they lose? Of the 383 participants, the entire group lost 3,998 pounds. Now this sounds like a lot. But when you average that among the 383 participants, each participant lost a little over 10 pounds each. So what do you think? Was this a success? The participants overall did lose weight, but we really do not know how much each individual lost. So back to our lecture. How do groups and teams differ? A baseball team may train together every afternoon and therefore they share a common objective and interact with each other in a formal way. Therefore, they would be considered a group. Multiple fans may show up to a baseball game on Saturday, which is not defined as a group since the fans do not interact with each other in a structured manner. In essence, a collection of individuals is not necessarily a group. So all teams are groups, but not all groups are teams. So how are groups and teams similar? What distinguishes a group from a team? So what exactly makes a team? A sports team is a special type of group, apart from having a defined property of mutual interaction and task interdependence, teams have four key characteristics. They have a collective sense of identity. Members of a team frequently discuss participation in terms of we or we-ness rather than I or I-ness. They also have distinctive roles. All members know their job and role on the team. There are structured modes of communication. Typically, there is a structured line of communication. There's also team norms. Teams have social rules that guide members on what to do and what not to do. So examining some of the differences between team characteristics and group characteristics. Team characteristics include shared leadership, individual, collective, and mutual accountability, collective performance, encourages active problem solving, and individual skills are random and varied. Whereas group characteristics include individual leadership, individual accountability, individual work products, the sharing of information, and individual skills are complementary. In addition, teams typically deliver collective outcomes, engage in open and honest communication, and can't wait to work together. As opposed to groups, which usually deliver individual outcomes or products, engage in polite conversations, and meet only because they have to. And lastly, team members feel a sense of ownership. Members work to resolve conflict. All members share responsibility for the outcome. This leads to greater motivation to support members in need. And we also see a greater motivation to support members in need while group members are focused on themselves and their abilities. The members are often unable to resolve their conflicts. Each member is responsible for their own performance. Group members are typically not motivated to help a needy co-member. I'm sure at some point during your university experience, you've probably been asked to engage in group work. Based on these characteristics, how many of you felt like the project was actually teamwork? 
Or is group work an appropriate name for the activity? My guess is that a lot of you would identify that the work is not truly group work. There are likely very few components of teamwork in the activity, which is really sad and incredibly unfortunate. It is the assumption that groups move progressively through different stages. Issues can arise at each stage of the progression that must be navigated before the group can move forward. Groups go through four stages as they develop and prepare to carry out the group's tasks. These include forming, storming, norming, and performing. In the first stage, forming, the team members familiarize themselves with other team members. Members engage in social comparison and assess other group members' strengths and weaknesses. This is the time when interpersonal relationships are formed and the team structure develops. In the second stage, storming, this is where rebellion often occurs. As each group member is trying to establish their role and their status within the group, this is commonly a resistance to the leader, resistance to control by the group, and interpersonal conflict. In order to work through this stage, leaders need to communicate with participants objectively and openly to resolve these conflicts. In the third stage, norming occurs. Hostility is replaced by solidarity and cooperation and conflicts are resolved to create a sense of unity among group members. In the final stage performing, the team members finally play well together to channel their energies towards team success. The team focuses on problem solving, using group processes and their new relationships to work on tasks. Structural issues within the group have been resolved Interpersonal relationships continue to develop and strengthen, and roles become well-defined for the members. Every group develops its own structure, or group roles, which are determined by the interaction of its members. For a group to become effective, certain structural characteristics must develop. The behaviors of the group members require or expected of a person occupying a certain position must be well defined. It is important to have both role clarity and role acceptance, which are critical for team success. The group progression. We start with a group environment. This has a distinctiveness of individuals who are assigned to complete a task or reach a common goal. Often, there is a given group structure. This creates group norms and personal positions within the group. The group environment and the group structure lead to group processes. These are the interactions and communication among the group members. This may also require sacrifices from individual members for the benefit of the whole. Once the members are able to do these things, this leads to group cohesion and ultimate success. Within group structure, we create group norms. These are the level of performance or patterns of behavior or beliefs from members of a group. The leader needs to establish a positive group norm or standards, for example, being productive, as well as group environment. The team climate and effectiveness develop from how individuals perceive the interrelationships among the group members. Some factors for team climate are more easily influenced than are others. Social support refers to an exchange of resources between at least two individuals perceived by the provider or the recipient to be intended to enhance the well-being of the recipient. Mutual respect and support enhances team climate. Social support provides appraisal information, reassurance, and companionship. It reduces uncertainty during times of stress, aids in mental and physical recovery, and improves communication skills. 
Proximity suggests that people are more likely to bond when they are near each other. Closer contact can promote and increase team interaction. Distinctiveness. When a group feels distinct, its feelings of unity and oneness increase. Distinctiveness can be promoted by uniforms, traditions, initiation rites, mottos, traditions, or even special privileges. The more distinctive a group feels, the better the climate. Additional elements of effective team climate include fairness and similarity. Fairness is an important aspect of the team climate, as is trust. And at the core of trust is an athlete's perception of being treated fairly. Every member should believe that their effort and contribution is evaluated objectively and evenly. Fairness, or the lack of it, can bring a team closer together or it can tear it apart. Similarity among team members in commitment, attitudes, aspirations, and goals are important to developing a positive team climate. The greater the team similarity, the more positive the team climate becomes. A coach's responsibility is to get individual players to play together as a team. Many coaches believe that a group of the best individuals usually does not make for the best team. A good team is more than a sum of its parts. The abilities of individual team members do not always serve as good predictors of how a team will perform. Ivan Steiner in 1972 developed a model to show the relationship between individual abilities or resources on a team and how the team members interact. Steiner's model suggests that the actual productivity is equal to the potential productivity minus the losses attributable to faulty group processes. The potential productivity refers to a team's possible best performance given each player's ability, knowledge, and skills, as well as the demands of the task. Individual ability is the most important resource for teams, which would then suggest that a team made up with the best individuals will usually achieve the most success. However, a team's actual productivity does not usually match its potential productivity. Two kinds of losses are attributable to faulty group processes motivational loss, and coordination loss. Motivational losses occur when the team members do not give 100% effort. Coordination losses occur when the timing between the teammates is off or when ineffective strategies are utilized. The model describes a sequence where starting from the occasion or critical event within the group process or input, the coordinator performs a specific coordination activity or process and then perceives the reaction of the group or individual group members, which is the outcome. Within subjective coordination theories, this basic sequence is considered to be moderated by three additional group coordination variables, the task requirements perceived by the expert, the expert's attitude towards the coordination, and the expert's knowledge about group functioning. So what does this all boil down to? If more cooperation and interaction are necessary, individual ability decreases and the importance of group productivity increases. Individual abilities do not neatly sum up to the group or team performance. The Ringelmann effect was an obscure, unpublished study on individual and group performance on a rope-pulling task conducted by Ringelmann nearly a hundred years ago. Ringelmann observed individuals and groups of two, three, and eight pulling on a rope. He observed that the relative performance of each individual progressively declined as the number of people in the group increased. This is a term known as social loafing. This is used for the phenomenon in which individuals in a group or team put forth less than 100% effort because of loss in motivation. Individual productivity attributable to social loafing 
are greatest when the contributions of individual group members are not identified, are dispensable, or are disproportionate to the contributions of other group members. So how do we identify social loafing? We can emphasize the importance of individuals' pride and unique contributions. We can increase identifiability of individual performances, determine specific situations where social loafing occurs. We can conduct individual meetings to discuss social loafing. Sometimes it also helps to be empathetic and put yourself in somebody else's place. Trying to understand and seeing things from their point of view can help us to become more empathetic. We could also try to break down the team into smaller units. Cohesion is the total field of forces which act on members to remain in a group. Karen defined cohesion as a dynamic process reflected in the tendency for a group to stick together and remain united in the pursuit of its goals and objectives. There are two distinct types of forces that act on a group. The first is task cohesion. It reflects the degree to which members of a group work together to achieve common goals and objectives. The second is social cohesion. This is the interpersonal attraction among group members. This is the degree to which members of a team like each other and enjoy being in each other's company. Group cohesion has two major categories. The first of the two categories is a member's perception of the group as a totality, also known as group integration. Within group integration, there are two subcategories. The task is a goal that the team is trying to reach as a unit. And the second is social. For example, do members of the team stick together outside of practice and or games? The second major category is a member's personal attraction to the group, also known as individual attraction to the group. Within the individual attraction to the group, there are two subcategories. Task, for example, do you like the style of play on this team? And finally, social. Some of my friends are on the team, which makes someone want to stay. These beliefs are thought to influence a group's and an individual group member's sense of cohesion. We see different motivational factors between young athletes and older athletes. Young athletes discriminated along the lines of task versus social cohesion and less along the individual group dimension than adult athletes did. There are four major factors affecting the development of cohesion in sport and exercise settings. These include environmental, personal, leadership, and team factors. Environmental factors are the most general and remote. These are normative forces holding the group together. Frequently, this is impacted by the size of the group. Smaller groups are more cohesive than are large groups. Personal factors refer to the individual characteristics of the group members. The most important personal factor is the individual member's satisfaction level. Another factor is the cohesive similarity, which is frequently a demographic attribute, including similarity in attitudes, aspirations, commitments, and expectations. Leadership factors include the leadership style and behaviors that professionals exhibit and the relationship that they establish with their groups. The role of a leader is vital to team cohesion. Team factors refer to group task characteristics in both individual and team sports, group productivity norms, desire for group success, group roles, group positions, and team stability. Team factors are affected by the prior success of the team, the communication among the team members, team goals, and the importance of the achievements of the team. This is a visual demonstration of the correlates of cohesion. 
We have cohesion in team sports. This is influenced by four factors. The first is the environmental factors. Cohesion is also impacted by personal factors. Another factor that should be considered is leadership factors. And finally, there's an impact from team factors. The cohesion of a team results in various positive outcomes. For the group, cohesion results in team stability and performance effectiveness of the team. For the individual, we see resulting desired behavioral outcomes and performance effectiveness of the individual. In addition, we also see associated personal satisfaction increase among individuals who experience team cohesion. For the most part, research indicates that there is a positive relationship between cohesion and performance. Cohesion can affect performance dependent upon the nature of interactions among team members along a continuum from interactive to coactive. Coactive sports such as bowling require much less, if any, team interaction and coordination for the achievement of goals. Coactive teams show no cohesion performance relationship. Interacting teams such as volleyball require that team members work together to coordinate their actions. Interactive teams demonstrate that cohesion increases team performance. There is a circular relationship between cohesion and performance. Increased cohesion leads to greater performance and brings teams together, which leads to more cohesion. However, the performance to cohesion relationship appears stronger than the cohesion to performance relationship. This is a key point. The relationship between cohesion and performance appears to be circular. Performance success leads to increased cohesion, which in turn leads to increases in performance. So if increasing cohesion can increase the performance and chances of being successful, then how can we enhance cohesion? One method would be to examine exercise settings. Dropout rates for traditional formal exercise programs are approximately 50%. So could we focus on cohesion to increase attendance rates? Research has demonstrated that exercise classes with good group cohesion have fewer dropouts and fewer late arrivals than do classes low in cohesion. So let's see if we can apply what we've learned. As you follow along in the lecture, I would encourage you to use a different solution to each of the following situations. With these problems, we will try to overcome barriers. So problem number one, you're working with a group that has frequent disagreements or trouble working together. What should they do? What would you recommend? So what could we do? Remember, this isn't the only answer. There's more than one right answer. So if you were thinking something different, then that's okay too. Among many other solutions, you could encourage individuals to agree to disagree, remind them about the common goals and ask them to sacrifice, and ask them to sacrifice or to put the group goals ahead of their personal differences. What about problem two? Our team members don't agree on individual roles in relation to team success. They are bickering over who should do what. This is extremely common with younger teams or new teams. How would you handle this? What would you suggest? Again, only one suggestion of what we could do is to clarify individual roles in relation to team success. We need to allow people to learn to appreciate the value of all positions. We can even use a challenge system to clarify who is more competent in specific positions. Or, if you have them, you could look back at player statistics to determine roles on a team. So what about problem number three? In this situation, there are team problems, dysfunctional attitudes, pent-up issues, individuals are not getting along, and a lot of petty arguments, among other things. 
As a whole, this situation seems a little dysfunctional. So what could we do with this? We may initiate a series of team meetings. This could allow people to describe the situation or the problem. They could also express feelings about the problem, specify changes, and discuss consequences of continued behavior. This allows people to take ownership over their actions and feel more empowered. Problem four, how do you encourage cohesion through individual sacrifice and being less selfish? So what could we do? My suggestion is to encourage sacrifice through investment. We could assign members to help newcomers with team protocols, orientation, and to even learn social norms. This allows new members to be active in setting team goals and other decision-making capabilities. And lastly, problem five. A team has social cliques within the team. How do you prevent it? One of the things we could do, clicks often form when teams are losing, when athletes' needs are not being met, or when coaches treat certain people different from others. We would need to address these issues to help prevent clicks from forming on a team. So we're back to our notes. Let's wrap this chapter up. As long as communication is effective and open, coaches and leaders can foster group cohesion in several ways. First, we can communicate effectively. We need to create an environment where everyone is comfortable expressing their thoughts and feelings. We can explain individual roles on the team. We need to stress the importance of each individual's role on the team's success. We can develop pride within subunits. Players need the support of their teammates, especially those playing the same position. Set challenging team goals. Setting specific, challenging goals has a positive effect on individual and group performances. Goals set a high norm for productivity and keep the team focused on what needs to be accomplished. We can encourage team and group identity. We can do this by ordering jerseys or scheduling social functions for the team. We can also discourage the formation of social cliques. Social cliques often only benefit a few athletes often at the expense of alienating most of the other team members. We could encourage team functions to battle the development of cliques. We can also try to avoid excessive turnover. Excessive turnover decreases cohesion and makes it difficult for members to establish close rapport. Veteran players can help integrate new players into a team. We can also conduct periodic team meetings. This allows members to honestly, openly, and constructively express positive and negative feelings. Try to enhance team efficacy. The development of collective competence can increase players' feelings about their personal involvement with the team's productivity and objectives. Know the team climate. A coach or leader should identify group members who have high interpersonal prestige and status in the group. We can rely on these individuals for feedback regarding the ideas, opinions, and feelings of individuals on the team. And finally, get to know something personal about each group member. Getting to know and understand team members' roles, views, motives, and needs is a cornerstone of the team building process. Team unity and cohesion is not only the coach's responsibility. Individual members have a responsibility to create cohesion as well. Here are some ways that group members can improve communication and build strong, cohesive units. Know their other group members. The better the team members know each other, the easier it is to accept individual differences. Provide help to group members whenever possible. Being a team means the individuals are mutually interdependent. Helping each other helps to foster team spirit and brings individuals closer. Provide positive reinforcement. Supporting teammates instead of being negative is critical to building trust and support. Be responsible. Take ownership of your actions. Blaming others serves no useful purpose. 
Communicate honestly and openly with the coach or leader. The better everyone understands everyone else, the better the chances for team success and harmony. Resolve conflicts immediately. We need to take the initiative to solve conflicts immediately, rather than vent and complain about our feelings. Negative feelings that build up can explode later and often lead to resentment. Give 100% effort at all times. Working hard helps bring a team together. Dedication and commitment are contagious, so let's spread it.